India's economic growth for 2015 stands at a staggering 7.3%, yet the country cannot create enough jobs to lift its people from poverty. It has a labor force of 502 million people, yet 49% are employed in the agricultural sector, which only contributes to 14% of the country's economy. It's these contradictions that Prime Minister Narendra Modi wants to change under the Make in India project. This initiative seeks to transform India into a manufacturing hub for vehicles, electronic systems, pharmaceuticals, as well as a hub for hydrocarbon and nuclear energy. This colossal task is the greatest economic reform in modern Indian history. It seeks to unleash the country's true potential. Yet, change comes at a price. In this report, we will analyze the Make in India initiative and explain what obstacles the Prime Minister faces and how he intends to solve them. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. The primary purpose behind the Make in India initiative is not just to transform the economy, but to create new jobs. This is one of Modi's top economic priorities. In a land of 1.2 billion people, it should come as no surprise that every month nearly a million citizens enter the job market. This makes managing unemployment in India a daunting task. Modi's plan to stimulate economic growth starts with reforming the labor legislations. Presently, Indian labor laws make it very hard for companies to fire workers. As a result, most companies are unwilling to risk hiring an employee whom they cannot dismiss. Instead, they will seek to invest in better software or machinery. Thus, even though the economy grows at a pace of 7%, it has not yielded in more jobs. As a result, instead of seeking formal jobs, the majority of Indians turn to the informal market. This includes jobs with no fixed incomes and systematic work conditions, such as construction workers, mechanics, shopkeepers and more. Currently, about 80% of India's 502 million labor force is employed in the informal economy. Ironically, Indian labor laws, which were meant to protect workers in a formal economy, have actually hurt the job market and stimulated an informal economy and poverty. Modi is seeking to pass several legislations that would reform the labor laws. He has already reduced the number of labor laws from 44 to just 5 core legislations. However, the Prime Minister has reached a political dead end. For instance, in September 2015, labor unions affiliated with the political opposition, the Indian National Congress, who represent about 150 million workers, launched a nationwide strike. Since then, Modi has backed down and there have been no signs that the core labor laws will change anytime soon. Since his labor laws reforms have reached a political stalemate, Modi has shifted to stimulate growth by manipulating the monetary policy, in other words, by cutting the interest rates. But here too, Modi has reached an impasse. Raghuram Rajan and Urjit Patel, the former and president chief executives of the Reserve Bank of India, have refused to lower the interest rates below 6.5%. Both men argued that by cutting interest rates, Indian banks would give out more loans. This would create more jobs and small businesses, but it would also devalue the currency, meaning inflation would rise. Many will argue that leaders must focus on long-term objectives, however, as an elected official, Modi's actions have electoral consequences. Therefore, many of his objectives tend to focus on short-term policies. On the other hand, Rajan and Patil as appointed public officials have the freedom to focus on long-term objectives. So even though Modi fully understands that inflation will hurt the economy in the long term, he needs to present short-term results. Rajan resigned from his office in early September, yet before he left, he established the Monetary Policy Committee. This group, consisting of six people, is responsible for setting the interest rates. Thus, even in the absence of Rajan, Modi will have a hard time adjusting the interest rates. 
Ultimately though, monetary manipulation is not a substitute for genuine growth. Modi's desire to reform the economy also depends on the business environment, which requires a decent infrastructure and clear tax regimes. According to the government's five-year plan, India needs to invest about $1 trillion to modernize its railways, ports, roads, highways, bridges and more. This estimate, designated for 2012 to 2017, amounts to $200 billion annually. However, India's national budget for 2016 stands at $289 billion. In other words, New Delhi does not nearly have enough money to modernize the infrastructure by itself. Instead, Modi wants about half of the trillion dollar estimate to be funded by the private sector. To raise the necessary funds, Modi must rely on foreign direct investment. His attempts to acquire more investment is already yielding results. In 2015, India received a record $40 billion in foreign direct investment, which is an increase of 30% compared to the previous year. Yet as high as this amount is, it's not sufficient to fully modernize the business environment. India requires an annual foreign direct investment of at least $100 billion. In fact, the total amount of required foreign direct investment is even higher when one considers the other segments of the economic reforms. The Make in India initiative also seeks to increase the manufacturing sector share of the economy from 16% to 25% by 2022. The government believes that this would yield in at least 100 million jobs in the manufacturing sector. And this is where the Make in India initiatives comes full circle. For India to achieve its goals and to attract the necessary foreign direct investment, New Delhi must reform its labor and land acquisition laws as well as its tax regimes. We explained the land labor laws earlier, however improving the business environment also depends on land acquisition laws and tax regimes. Currently, India's land acquisition law of 2013 requires companies to obtain approval from at least 70% of the local residents before the land can be acquired. Since nearly 70% of Indians live in villages, the acquisition law complicates matters for companies seeking to expand their base of operations in India. Modi is trying to adjust the acquisition law, but since the legislation has a direct impact on the majority of Indians, it's an extremely difficult task. One more legislation that the Prime Minister is seeking to adjust is the Goods and Services Tax Bill, also known as the GST Bill. Basically, the legislation seeks to introduce value-added tax in India, which is a common consumption tax in Europe and many other countries. For outsiders, this is hard to imagine, but in India, every state has a different tax code. As a result, one cannot freely transport goods within India. Instead, one has to stop at the state borders and pay the entry tax. The biggest complication with these tax regimes is not the tax fee itself, but the dreadful paperwork, which can take up to several hours. Obviously, this hinders further economic growth. Modi is now trying to get the GST bill approved by the parliament, and the legislation would create a single national market and therefore enhance internal movement of goods and services. The bill would also lower manufacturing costs and boost domestic consumption. However, some states want to protect their tax base and thus oppose the GST bill. Yet perhaps the biggest obstacle to the bill, as well as other legislations, is India's complex legislative process. For instance, introducing a single national market through the GST legislation would also boost inflation for about two years. For Modi, Timing is everything. His actions have electoral consequences. This becomes more evident when one considers that India's next general elections is scheduled for 2019. Meaning, if Modi wants inflation to drop by 2019 so he stands a chance to get re-elected, then he must get the GST bill approved as soon as possible. As things go, once approved by the parliament, the legislation would also have to be approved by every Indian state. 
The opposition party fully understands the inflation deadline, so they are deliberately seeking to delay the legislation in hope that inflation will remain high during the 2019 elections. Such a scenario could ultimately cost Modi the elections. Overall, India has 7 national political parties, 48 state parties and another 1600 state-affiliated organizations. Working within these parameters is no easy task. Currently, Modi's ruling party holds a majority in the lower house of the parliament. However, to pass the land, labor and tax legislations, Modi must increase his party's representation in the upper house of the parliament. At the present, the opposition party holds enough seats to block legislations. To gain a majority in the upper house of the parliament, the ruling party must win state assembly elections. Five such elections are scheduled for 2016. These will be essential for the success of the Make in India project. Ultimately, India's complicated bureaucracy is too often exploited by elected and public officials. This, above everything else, forms the country's greatest obstacle. Aside the legal proceedings, one more crucial component will determine the success of the Make in India initiatives. Economies run on energy. As India expands its manufacturing sector, its appetite for energy will grow. New Delhi must seek to acquire new sources of energy as well as address the implementation of new technologies. This and more we will cover in part 2 of the Make in India initiative. This was a Caspian report by Mishirvan. I just want to thank the following people for their contributions on Patreon. And if you want to help with the costs of the show, please visit our Patreon page in the description. For now, thank you for watching, take care and sagol.